my senior year of high school, I saved up a bunch of money to pay cash for my first car. And because I was 17 and a minor at the time, my mom had access to my bank account and she decided to take that money to pay off some of her debt. No, that I'm was the money for my car. I'm so sorry. Yo, 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 what's up, what's up? This is John with the Dr. John DeLone Show. God, I'm so happy to be talking to you guys. Hope you're doing well and hope your families are healthy. Hope your son is out wherever you are. If it's raining, I hope you are curled up with a good book. Probably none of those things are happening, but it's always fun just to toss out some, some sunshine out there, right? Hey, if you want to be on the show, the greatest mental health and marriage podcast ever, if you want to be on the show, give me a buzz, 1-844-693-3291. It's 1-844-693-3291 or go to johndeloney.com slash ask. And please don't forget, listen, the the number of downloads per month is in the millions and the number of subscriptions is not. Hit the subscribe button, please, please, please. It really helps us out and it helps out people who have never heard of this show ever. And um, if you think this show is miserable and torture, then you can torture people you don't like. That's fantastic. But if you think it's going to help other people, um, man, it's such a gift just hitting the subscribe button or the like button or whatever the buttons are these days. All right, that's enough of that. Let's go to Leslie in St. Paul. What's up, Leslie? Hi, Dr. John. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Life's Life's going okay? Yeah. (laughs) Excellent. What's up? How can I help? So, um, something I've been wrestling with internally is wanting to break generational curses as a first generation immigrant, but, you know, feeling a lot of guilt. So I had called into the Dave Ramsey show and it was mostly a financial question. Um, my senior year of high school, I saved up a bunch of money to pay cash for my first car. And because I was 17 and a minor at the time, my mom had access to my bank account and she decided to take that money to pay off some of her debt. Oh, no, and that I'm was the money for my car. I'm so sorry. So I called and George and Christina kind of helped me with the financial aspect. But I was wondering if you could guide me through the emotional aspect of You know, I'm in college right now. I'm studying really hard to get a good job and like avoid debt. But then there's that emotional part of it. What's your, what's your cultural background? Um, West African. Okay. Is that a strongly maternal culture? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, no, it's very uh, patriarchal, actually. Okay, okay. Um, oh, man. Here's the thing. Uh, let's, let's, this is hard to do, and it's really probably not the right thing to do, but let's take the cultural aspect. You know what? You can't. I can't just tell you to, to scoot that over. Let me just say this. Um, I think in, in, in my Western context, taking somebody's money from them is wrong across the board. It is in my culture too. I mean, I was okay. talking to my siblings, my aunts and uncles. Most people would agree that this is wrong. I mean, it's, <laughs> so yeah, maybe you should take the culture. Well, like that well I, I don't want to do that. I, I don't, I, I think that's, that's been a problem as though you can just take culture on and off like a pair of sunglasses. Right. Um, but that, that helps me because there are cultures that your kids are very much yours and so what's what's theirs is yours and so it would be seen as something that in my house would i would consider stealing it, you're a thief you stole from me and in other cultures it might not be seen that way so i want to be sensitive to that but at the same time i want to honor your request to begin to create your new life here um as a first gen immigrant and you get to begin to wrestle with how do you hold on to the heritage parts of your heritage that you want to keep and you want to be a part of your life moving forward how do you how do you grab onto these this new western culture that you're learning and then really what do you have designed for your life and it sounds like if i i don't want to speak into too much but it it sounds like what you're saying is i have to grieve the loss of my mother because she stole from me and i'm done with that relationship is that fair well, I don't want to be done with the relationship because I know she has a lot of hurt herself, but I do think that it's wrong. Okay, like, let me stop you right there. You aren't responsible for her hurt. 
and her hurt doesn't give liberty for her to steal from you. Okay. I always, always think parents have a right to be treated with dignity or res- and respect, even if it's in a dignified way, in a respectful way, saying, I'm never going to talk to you again. Okay? Or saying, mm-hmm. "I." the word here is boundaries. You are going to have to learn how to create boundaries that keep you safe, keep your stuff safe, and sometimes staying safe inside of a boundary also hurts really bad because it's lonely. And you should have your mom as your number one fan in your life right now and your mom took from you. Mm -hmm. And let me also uh, add this layer. She took your money, but I think she took something bigger from you. I think what she also took from you is your, your supports. Like you were resting on her and then suddenly she pulled that, that, uh, support out from under you. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And it's almost like you lost your money and that's heartbreaking and all that. You had plans for that money, but it's almost heartbreaking in like, it's like you're walking on sand now, right? Like you can't get a firm, firm grasp on the ground. I don't know. Tell me, tell me, keep talking. Yeah. So like the financial aspect is one thing, but then it was like the manipulation and the gaslighting that ensued, like almost, almost being blamed for it. Essentially that's, that was like, okay, well, you know, money comes and goes, it can be replaced, but the manipulation and gaslighting. And then also like, Hey, hey, Leslie, ma- Leslie, make sure you're talking into your phone, okay? Yeah. There you go. And then also trying to build my own financial picture, but then like knowing that I'm responsible for someone else's at the same time is very stressful. You're not. You're 18 years old. Okay. Now, here's the, here's, here's the deal. If you make big, if you make adult decisions, sometimes they come with adult consequences. What do I mean by that? You get your own account so that your mom can't take it anymore. Which I did. Okay. Do you pay your own tuition? Uh, I get full ride scholarships. Okay. So no, I don't pay any tuition. But I mean, you're not dependent on her financially. Nope, not at all. Okay. Um, now you have to decide how much I, you can be around her. Emotionally, physically, financially. Before you become somebody that you do not want to become. You become somebody who is snippy, who has to hide things, who can't tell the truth, who, whatever, because it's not safe. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand. And this is going to be really hard because you're 18 years old and your mom should be your number one cheerleader. And instead, your mom's leading the charge of making it difficult for you to find your footing as you grow into adulthood. Yeah. Have you grieved that? Have you sat down and just wept? Or have you just been angry? Yeah, I remember one time I just had a total emotional breakdown. I was just like sobbing, like crying hysterically to the point where like she could hear me all the way upstairs. Mm-hmm. And then she came in my room. And she's like, oh my gosh, why are you crying? And you didn't even tell me. Um, I can't believe that I'm not the first person you would run to. Oh, and I didn't do anything wrong um, by taking your money. I didn't do anything wrong, so I don't understand why you're crying. So that was that was the response I got. And you know that's manipulative, right? Yes, I, I understand. Okay. And there's something deeper than that manipulation. You know that that's your mother severing the relationship and that hurts. Hmm. It's really easy to stop at the act that makes us enraged or scared, but beneath that... The, the most core relationship you have is with your mom. Mm-hmm. And she told you through her actions, this relationship is over now. It is something different. And quite honestly, you've probably known that for a long time. Is that fair? I guess. This type of manipulation and dishonesty and thievery doesn't just happen once. Mm-hmm. It's, it's happened to um, other siblings as well. So. Okay, okay. So the real question is, what are you going to do now? Well, so obviously I'm keeping my stuff separate now. Mm -hmm. And 
I don't know. Like, obviously, I morally, it does not feel right to me to leave your parents destitute for retirement. But I also understand that my finances have to come first. So I don't know. I guess I'm struggling internally with finding, like, the right balance. Is it you that's leaving them destitute or is it your mom choosing to not work and your dad choosing to not work? Or are they unable um, so to? My, she does work, but she has a bunch of debt that she's making no effort to pay off. How is an 18-year-old kid going to be re- more responsible for her adult mother's life than her adult mother? Um, I guess I can't and shouldn't. It, it's... You're not, you not only are you not being invited in to be a part of this solution, um, you're being excluded from this, right? You're, um, uh, it's a very parasitic relationship. Right. Cause like she has a job where she makes like 13 bucks an hour yeah. and we're like, you are starving. You, you can't continue doing that because, but because it's such an easy job, she doesn't want to quit and do something that yes, is more difficult, but like would pay more. Has she asked you to come help pay her bills? Uh, yeah. And then I didn't do that. So that's also like a source of tension. In fact, she's like 45 and she's like, I should be retired right now. I shouldn't have to work. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Wow. Um, Leslie, you just, here's the deal. You just got some hard decisions ahead of you. Um, I agree with you. I would not let my parents be destitute either, but I'm older. I'm in my forties now. I'm not 18. Mm-hmm. At 18, there's very little you can do. And um, your parents have not asked you, hey, how can we make our situation different? They've stolen from you. How can we, do you know any insights? Do you know any new tips or tricks or hacks? And you could show them, you know, Ramsey Solution stuff on how to get out of debt. Or you could show them my friend Ken Coleman stuff on how to get a job. Um or you could point them to this show about how to improve your relationships and how to improve your mental health. They don't have any interest in that. And so there comes a moment when you continuing to give them money is actually disrespectful because you're participating in, you're accelerating their demise, if you will. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Right. Right. And so don't participate in their desire to, to not be well. But also, I think, like, first of all, she barely speaks English and can, can't read or write. So also, I sympathize with her in that sense. Like, she can't just pick up the Dave Ramsey total money of makeover. Course. And read it. Of course. It's hard. Like, there's, like, and that's what I'm saying. There's no easy path forward here. And I'm not saying that your mom, um, I mean, her path is really challenging. It's very, very difficult very difficult and it's lonely and it's disconcerting and she's lost her her culture right um and she's thrown into this chaos like i i get all of that it's all hard the challenge for you is being very honest with yourself and choosing reality mm-hmm. you can't heal that for her She can take steps and she can invite you in. And an invitation is much different than stealing. A plan is much different, is more different than a, than a bailout, if you will. Mm-hmm. And so my heart is broken for her and with her. I totally, I empathize with her all the way. And I know that until she decides, I want this to be different. And here's the deal. I worked with immigrant students my whole career. They were some of the, like, you better get out of their way, dude, because <laughs> there was no stopping them. No stopping them. And so there is, I've seen it over and over and over and over again. People deciding enough is enough. I'm going to make this different now. 
and I'm going to take advantage right. of every resource. And I know poverty's gnarly and I know I'm going to have to do something I don't want to do, which is ask for help and ask for help and ask for help and ask for help. And I'm going to have to lean on my kids, not in a, an impressive way, but in a, can you help me out kind of way. And I've just seen it over and over, Leslie, over and over. And until your mom comes to that or your dad comes to that on their own, you can't walk around being their parent. What's funny is that he does very well financially, but they keep their finances totally separate, which is, which is a whole nother situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's just them choosing to be uh, dysfunctional, like in, in their relationship. And again, there's so many layers here. There's a cultural layer. There's the um, educational layer. There's the you're my kid layer. There's the I didn't do anything wrong. There's so many layers here. And every time there's there's a bunch of layers, I want to clear the deck and write down on a piece of paper what can I control and what I can I not control. And what I can control, I'm gonna go from I'm gonna go from there. I'm gonna do those things. I'm gonna take care of those things. And you can love your mom, and like I said, you can treat her with dignity and you can treat her with respect. But you can't make her decide that she's gonna take care of herself. You can't make her decide that she is going to um, have more self-worth than, well, I guess this is just all there is. And that you're going to continue to let her to take from you and to, if you will, hold you back. And in some shape, form, or fashion, the greatest gift you could give them is to go be really successful in school. But like you said, it's not even about money. Your dad's got money. They're just not sharing. They're just not sharing. Um, the whole thing's a mess here. If you were my friend and we were sitting down having nachos, I would tell you, write down a piece of paper, control what I can control, and let the rest of the stuff go. And just know when it comes to family, when it comes to culture, when it comes to all this mess, letting those things go hurts and it's painful and you have to grieve it. But just because it hurts doesn't mean it's wrong. Just because it hurts doesn't mean it's wrong. We'll be right back. I've got a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Listen, I've been on both ends of therapy in my life. I've gotten it myself and I've walked people through it. And I've seen the benefits from both sides when someone owns their past and the cracks in their armor. But here's the deal. Getting to know yourself is not a one-time event. Acknowledging the stories that make you who you are can be a lifelong process. And talking through things with the right sounding board empowers you to change your future and be the best version of yourself. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, I recommend BetterHelp. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can walk with you on that journey of self-discovery. And it's 100% online, and it's designed to be convenient, flexible, and work for your schedule. Just fill out a quick questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And if it's not the right fit, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Deloney today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Deloney. All right, we're back. Um, let's just get right into it. It's time for more facts of your friends. Let's do it. Please, God, change this music. Please. There's so much good music out there. There's too much, they say. Please, please. Hey, it's facts of your friends. Everybody's favorite. All right. Um, today, we're talking about uh, an article. It's, it's, it's relatively old. Um, it's a couple years old, uh, 2021 20, by Gary Lewandowski. I think that's how you say his last name. Um, he's a writer for Psychology Today, which is online um, uh, psychology magazine, I guess. I, they used to have in grocery stores. Um, trying to think. It's more pop psychology. Um, they do have all sorts of articles. But anyway, um, Kelly, you, you found this. Yes, I did. The 10 most common sources of conflict in relationships. Um, so I went through this and I'm going to kind of do it out of order. And I ended up focusing on a few things other than those 10 things. So study of 2,600 married couples from Britain, China, Russia, Turkey, and the U.S. found the most common sources of conflict. Drum roll, please. Huge surprise here. Not really. Division of labor inside the home, finances, raising children, and sex. And women were more likely to report problems than men. No way. 
<laughs> no way. Man, this these are our research dollars hard at work, America. All right, I want to talk about these five for a minute before I get to... I'll run through the other stuff. But I'm going to get to these five. Division of labor. I have... Man, I'm going to get myself in trouble here, and that's fine. I feel like there's some truth-telling that needs to happen here. This is often regulated along two distinct lines. And one is discussed a lot, and the other one isn't. And I've never heard it discussed anywhere other than in quiet whispers with a group of guys playing poker or just going for walks in the woods because they don't know why their wives don't like them so much. Here's number one. We talk about this, and we've got to talk about it more. Women's roles at home, even with the vast acceleration of women into the workforce, I think this weekend it was seven out of 10 college graduates are women. I mean, the, the scales have tipped so far the other way. Women are in the workforce. They're in higher education. They are um, they're closing the, the pay gap. And women still take on the lion's share of household chores. And yes, I think it's because men don't see this as, quote unquote, their job. And I know this is going to get me in trouble, but sometimes women do see it as, quote unquote, their job. And there's this disconnect and men go home and they prop their feet up and they then wonder where their dinner magically is. And they wonder how these diapers are magically getting changed. That exists. The research does, if I'm being honest, it says that gap is closing, but it is still not close to being closed. And, and, the other line is often one partner in a romantic relationship determines the benchmark for household chores, what needs to be done around here, and then criticizes or complains the other's not agreed upon standard. And we don't talk about that enough. That's usually talked in hushed whispers. For instance, I'll just use my house for example, because my wife doesn't listen to this show, so it's okay. I could do just fine with the dishes being done Two or three times a week, maybe once a week, maybe once every other week. And for my wife, they need to be done every day, seven days a week. And so there's been conflict over time in our marriage because she says, you don't help out around here. And I'm looking around suggesting there's no help needed. Those dishes will be fine. There's like seven plates and four cups in the dishwasher. I mean, in the sink, nothing's on fire. There's more in the cabinet. And for her, that is one of the things that needs to be done before the day is over. And so I would challenge the notion, I'm not helping around the house. I would challenge that with this idea that we have not sat down and said, hey, here's what makes you feel whole in this house. Here's what makes me feel whole in this house. Let's get there. And then from there, if I don't do what we agreed upon, now we got a problem. Kelly. You're married. Am I off here? Oh, no way. I mean, that you just 100% described my marriage of... <laughs> oh, no. It's going to give me trouble. My husband saying, but the bathroom's clean. It means me saying, but it wasn't wiped down this weekend. And he'd be like, but it's clean. And so you go to your, your girlfriend's, you're hanging out, and she's like, Robert never cleans the bathroom. I got to go clean it. And he is staring off into the stars in the in the front yard in his underwear, just like, what am I doing wrong? I don't understand. Yeah, the neighbors don't like us very much, so maybe that explains why. Um, but yeah, because it's like, but to him, it's like, fine, look at it. There's and, nothing And so anywhere. the issue here isn't a reported, he's not helping around the house. It's really, we haven't sat down and established what does clean look like. And you giving a little bit and being like, okay, it doesn't have to be sandblasted every other Saturday. And him, you're like, yes, it does. Every Saturday, not every other. Thank you very much. <laughs> and him realizing that just because there's no dirty underwear on the floor, that doesn't mean clean. And I remember my mom telling me there's a difference between picked up and clean. I get that. That's the division of labor. This is the division of labor conversation. Okay? So, or do what we did and just hire someone. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, don't even get me going there. Hey, and on the other hand, I do want to call this out. Guys, get off your butts and help around the house. Just help. Anytime 
Here's the example. Anytime you're about to sit down and you look over and you see your wife not sitting down, you don't sit down yet. Don't sit down. I work hard all day. Shut up. Don't sit down. She needs to be. Shut up. Don't sit down. Before you sit down, ask her. Hey, is there anything I'm not seeing? Anything I can do to help? How can I love you better right now? Right this second. And she might say, sit down and put your feet up, man. You've been running like crazy. And she might say, it would mean the world to me if you could just go grab the hamper out of such and such kid's room. What a gift. What a gift. So I want every every wife, every husband, every couple listening to this, this talk about division of labor. I want you all to sit down and say, okay, where do you feel like I don't show up for you? And this is me, this, this, I'm not genderizing this. It could be any of you. Where am I not showing up for you when it comes to the division of labor in the household? And for those things that come up, like I do help around the, the kitchen. Oh, once a week. Well, that's all, that's all that needs to be cleaned. Okay, now we have not a division of labor issue, but a what does labor look like? An excellence issue. A I feel safe. I feel clean. I feel gross. I feel not enough. Um, whatever that looks like. And it may be that the kitchen needs to be this clean in case somebody comes over and they're going to judge you, husband or wife, by the cleanliness of your kitchen standards. And so if it's not up to that, that keeping up with the Joneses, someone may come over and judge me. So I'm going to blame him or blame her for not living up to this imaginary standard. You see how we get into this weird dance? So all that said, sit down and help each other out. The second one, finances. I think money finances is less about money and more about a couple of things. Number one, control. Whoever controls the money controls the house. And it can be controlled in one of two ways. The very abusive with significant correlation to physical abuse, the guy. And yes, I'm over genderizing this one. You don't spend money without me. You don't go to the store by yourself. You don't do any, like there's that kind of control. I run the money around here and that women can run the money. Like I, I am the person in charge of the money. I'll give you an allowance. So I hear that or, Hey, let me check with my wife to see if I can buy that. Sh Man, that means y'all haven't talked So that. There's that kind of control. There's also control. I just spend whatever I want, whenever I want. I buy whatever. You can't tell me what I can. I can't. There's that control too, which is madness. Also, Finances is about worth. In our culture, when you ask the question, what is he worth? What is she worth? We define that not by relationships and not by who she, who they're loved and who, who they love and who love them. We answer the question, what are you worth with a number, which is a tragedy. It's a cultural tragedy. But that's what we do. And if my number is low, it's easy to begin to feel like he's not pulling his weight. He's not worth much. I'm married to a loser. And that goes both ways, you know, both genders all over the place. And the third one, money is a really good indicator. You can look at how much you make right now and what your career trajectory is, and you can just push out 30 or 40 years and say, okay, this is about what our life's going to look like. And most of us don't like to live in that reality. So money tells you who you are and what you find valuable, how you spend money. And so couples need to sit down and say, hey, where are we going? What, what do we find valuable together in this life we've chosen to make together? It never ceases to amaze me as long as I live. People will create humans together. They'll share DNA, but they won't share a checking account. This is my money. This is his money. This is her money. I can't think of other than just outright abuse and infidelity. I can't think of something that's more divisive in a marriage. If you have to protect your own money, you shouldn't get married because you're not all in. You're mostly in. And mostly in doesn't work in marriage. All right, that can be a whole other conversation. Real quick, raising children. Um, I want to do it like this, or you want to do it like that, or my mom did it like this, or this is how I was raised. Kids are the parent, new parent scorecard. It's the report card for parents in the 21st century. Everyone's got steps and tips and tricks instead of focusing on your relationship with each other and focusing on your relationship with the kids. <sighs> That's a whole other conversation. But there's something about saying, okay, when this kid is 25, 
What do we want for this, our child? And I would start that conversation. I would, number one, I want my kid to want to come home. Why do I start there instead of I want my kid to be successful, I want my kid to be a Fortune 500 CEO, I want my, my kid to be married well? Whatever. Because everything, everything for a child is rooted in the attachment relationship with their parents. Everything. So whenever I think about my son or I think about my daughter, I, I push out to the age they're 25 and I hope wherever they are, married, kids, single, in the military, a roofer, getting a postdoc at Stanford, whatever. I, number one, first and foremost, want them to know, oh, dude, there's a safe place I can always go. There's two people that are rooting for me, no matter what. Raising kids, about relationship. Fourth one is sex. You know, we talk about this all the time on this show. Sex means everything in our culture, all of it, all at once. It's the most wild twist of fate, but here we are. Um, and uh, um, I'll, I'll blow past that one because we talk about that a lot here. I want to touch on this because it's important. Women are more likely to report problems than men. As Esther Perel has reported, as women have entered the workforce and earned economic independence, divorces have spiked because women no longer have to take abusive bum husbands. They can just leave. And throughout history, that has not been possible. And now you see it happening all over the world. Women are demanding more, and I want everyone to hear this. This is good for everybody. Everybody. And I love what Terrence Real says. The world of relationships has changed radically. It's exploded. Women have been lied to that they're all they need. You can do this all by yourself now. Now that you are economically independent, you need nobody. Their careers and independence will complete them and save them. This isn't true. This is bearing itself out in the mental health literature. And men... Just want to go back to the way things used to be. If we can just get these roles back the way they used to be, then everything will be fine. This is foolish and stupid. It's also not going to happen. What has to happen is a total rethinking of marriage and relationships and attachment and connection. This is why I do this show. is to paint a new picture of what life can look like when two people get on the same page and say, let's ride or die and let's do this thing right. And we don't, have a, we don't have a roadmap because this isn't how our parents did it. It's not how their parents did it before them. Terrence Real says, women are unhappy in their marriages because they want men to be more related, more relatable than most men know how to be. And men are unhappy in their marriages because their women seem so unhappy with them. I think that's so powerful. Women want a co-earner and a co- um, parent raiser and a co-partner and a and a somebody to share their dreams with or someone to talk with and someone to be romantic with and most men don't have all those skills that's all they are their skills and men just want to know why their wives don't like them like why don't you like me and I don't know how to ask that question, so I cover it up with beer and football games and loudness and whatever other thing I decide I'm going to crank out into the world. <sighs> so let's create a world where men can say, hey, I feel this thing, and then I'm going to go do the next right thing. And women can say, I feel this thing, and then I'm going to go do the next right thing, and we're going to do the next right thing together. And a quick buzz through these things, the 10 sources of conflict, partners condescending, possessive, jealous or dependent, neglecting, rejecting, unreliable, abusive, unfaithful, inconsiderate, um, physically self-absorbed, a great sign of immaturity there, moody, emotionally unstable, you spray your feelings all over the place, sexually withholding or rejecting, quick to sexualize others, you're always talking about how hot everybody else is. Some of you are listening to this and you're like, I don't know what to do. Here's a great place to start. If you're like, oh crap, that's me, that's me, that's me. Great place to start. 
get a babysitter. Take your significant other out, male or female, I don't care. And start the conversation like this. I'm sorry. I made you a project. I made you my dad. I was trying to be your mom. I thought complaining and nagging or avoiding and not participating was the way I could get through life. And I don't want that anymore. I want you and I to build something bigger and greater. And I'm going first. I'm sorry. I don't know how we get to where we're going from here, but I'm committed to, to ride if you are. Let's do something different. Let's create a life worth living. Let's create a life where we laugh a lot and it's not very anxious and it is a life of joy because it's going to be hard. So let's agree to do the hard stuff together and to create a life that's not anxious and that's fun while we can. Start there. Start there. Few, few conversations are made worse by starting with the words, I'm sorry. Let's minimize conflict if we can. We all need a little less conflict. We'll be right back. Hey, good folks, John Deloney here. I feel like I fell through a glitch in the matrix. This is my job. I get to have this show, do this show, walk alongside each one of you as a career. This is what I do, and I have a blast doing it. And me and the team, we're so thankful for all of you for being a part of our show. Whether you're one of the original 17 or you're one of the millions that's come since then, we are so grateful for you and we want to put together the best possible show that we can. So if you're one of the originals or if you're brand new, we want your feedback. Tell us what you love about the show, what you hate about the show, what you'd like to see more of, what you'd like to hear more of, and what you want us to never do again. You can email us at askjohn at ramseysolutions.com. That's askjohn at ramseysolutions.com with your feedback. Thank you for being such an important part of the show. Rock on. All right, let's go back to my hometown, H-Town, and talk to Alex. Hey, what's up, Alex? Dr. Deloney, how are you? I'm partying, man. How about you? Better than I deserve. Excellent. I'm not partying at all, actually. I'm at work. What are you doing, man? No, not much. Very cool. How can I help? Um, okay, well, um, um, and just in short, um, I have a history of being very rageful. Um, if a person is trying to make me mad or angry and they say the right thing, I can go from very happy to full on rage mode very quickly. Uh, this has resulted in a wedge between uh, my parents and myself. It resulted in me pushing away my ex girlfriend, whom I still love with all my heart. And I'm curious as to how I can get rid of this because it's turning me into something that I don't recognize. I mean, it's, it, it sounds like emotional regulation issues. How long have you been rageful? My mom says it started when I had brain surgery. <laughs> Alex, lead with that, dude. Lead with that. So I had brain surgery and then <laughs> I became... Uh, had some emotional regulations. What, what kind of brain surgery did you have? I've had epilepsy for 17 years. Okay, so you've got brain lesions. Did they go in and take out a chunk of your brain somewhere? what they do? They, they attempted to. So it was a week and a half of brain mapping. So that cut, they cut into yep. your brain, your, your skull, map out the brain. And they wait for your they seizures and then the, track them and trace them? And try to, to try to determine where exactly the seizures are coming from. Yeah. Where were yours coming from? They determined that it was, it was far too close to Broca's area that if they cut into that area um, and missed, mm -hmm. I would not I would not be able to speak for the rest of my life, worst case scenario. Oh, so that was down in your frontal lobe? Uh, nothing. Nothing. They said they made it my choice. They said we would need parental consent. No, no, no. I'm, say, I, 17. I'm saying it's down there. I th that's that area right behind your ear, right? Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and so it was close. It was far enough back that they didn't want to dig in there? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Um, yeesh. Okay. You know, I'm not. I'm not entirely certain if since I I didn't suffer like a a massive like massive brain damage or a head injury. I'm not sure if there's a correlation between change in behavior and just like an invasive surgery such as that. Um, but that's when my my parents said that. Um, my, my anger started to increase. 
Hmm. So I've got two trains of thought here, okay? And I want to just say outright, I'm not a neuroscientist by any stretch of the imagination, not even close, okay? Um, okay. My first thought is, have you heard of the Phineas Gage story? Yes, sir. The one the, the bolt went like through his eye and out his... his yeah, it, it shot through his frontal lobe. Survived? Yeah, he was a, a railroad guy in the 1800s and he was packing powder and it exploded and it shot it like a missile through his brain and... Um, but he lived. And mm -hmm. yeah. the story goes, before this happened, he was a fun-loving, fun guy. And the part of the brain that it severed, that it shot through, um, had to do with emotional regulation part of his brain and his frontal lobe. And he, the people around him said he became a radically different person. He was, couldn't keep down a job. And then 12 years later, he ended up with some pretty significant seizures and he passed away. But... He became really, they call him the father of neuroscience because it started this idea like, oh, there's certain parts of your brain that house certain activities and certain, um, where's memory and where's motor functioning and where is thought and where's laughter and where's fear. All that became, came from, oh, he lived. He's just a totally different guy now. And so that's my first thought. Either you've got a brain lesion somewhere or when they were in there messing around, um, Something happened. That's number one. The uh -huh. other side of it is, you may have heard me say this if you ever listen to the show, but anger, I believe, is, to quote Rage Against the Machine, anger, anger is a gift. It points us towards things that are not as they should be or as we see them, not as they should be. And I view rage as caged up anger with nowhere to go and it becomes explosive. And I can imagine if I'm you, now mm -hmm. again, I'm rattling off the top of my head here, okay? I, if I'm you and I've been suffering from seizures for so long, how, were they grand mal seizures? They're called partial complex. Ah, oh, geez. So okay. they, were, they only affect half of my brain. And do you know when they're coming or they just hit you out of the blue? Yes, I can tell when they're coming. And what's the, um, do you get catatonic? Do you, do you, have a full on seizure on the ground? Like what, what, what is your physical, um, expression of these seizures? So if I were to have one, um, just like, you know, in front of you face to face or to someone who is not familiar with, with what a seizure looks like, they would think that I'm kind of just like tuning them out and just, okay. you know, n not paying attention to what they're saying. I might just stand up and like walk around aimlessly, mm -hmm. uh, pick something out, put it down. Um, I'm, I'm, I've had one grand mal seizure in my life. Okay. So when you have these seizures, you feel them coming on. They come. Uh -huh. So frustrating. It's like you're not in control of your body, right? Exactly. They happen at least twice a day. Okay. And you go to all this brain mapping, all this surgery. They get all this stuff done. And they tell you, sorry, man, we can't help you. If that's me, I would be angry that I got this brain. I'm looking at all these kids in my grade and they've all got brains that are different. That seem to be functioning and they're drinking them and smoking them away. But I got one that chooses to shower me with elect electricity a couple of times a day. And I, I, and then the doctors say, Hey, we can't do anything for you. And that just puts a lid on that anger. And in my world, that's rage. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm telling you is, I don't know if this is um, physiological or if it's psychological. What I think is important is you've identified this as a problem. Is that fair? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Is it something that you have determined you are unable to help? Um, my, my anger. Yes. Your rage. You're, you're lashing out at people is what I'm asking you. Yes. Uh, for example, my parents, um, my ex-girlfriend was one of them. Um, I, I regret it immensely. But do you, do you, if you and I were just sitting across a table looking at each other, would you tell me she said a thing and I was physically unable to stop what happened next? 
Or if you plumb the depths of Alex, would you say, no, I was just so mad and frustrated. I just snapped, but I could have not. hard because it's a little bit of both um once i have started yelling at someone that's when i'm I'm, I'm unable to stop that's fine so what what how far up the river can you move i so for example the other the other night my mom said uh it was it was my fault that um my girlfriend and i broke up and it, she, she was right. She was just telling me things that were true that I did not want to hear. And I just kind of had, had to bite my tongue. And Let's stop right there. Let's stop it. right there. What if mm-hmm. when your mom starts telling you something you don't want to hear and you feel your body as though you feel a seizure coming on, you start to feel your body tense up and it starts to become a powder keg. What if you said, Mom, I love you. The things you're saying are are right. I need to distance myself from this conversation for a minute. Um, Let's circle back at another time. And that other time may be when you've had more rest. The other time may be when you're not stressed out. The other time may be before work instead of after work. Any number of things. Okay. But when I say how far up river can you get? There's a moment when you're going over the waterfall. It's too late, man. That thing's, we got to, we got to, that, that boat's going over the waterfall and we got to see what happens at the end of that cycle. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't know enough about, I, I wouldn't even know what to do if I looked at your brain scans or anything like that. So I don't know. I don't know what the surgeons did. I don't know any of that, of your psychological state. I don't know any of that stuff. But based on what you're telling me, I think the adventure is not trying to hold back a boat going over the waterfall. I think the adventure is knowing, uh uh-oh, I just found myself on this highway again, and this isn't a good highway for me. So I'm going to go ahead and just stop the car, and I'm going to get out and walk if I need to, but I'm not going to go down that highway. And what what I'm guessing you're going to find is some significant increases in self-control that you didn't otherwise have before. Does that make, am I making sense? Yes. Is that scary, Um, frustrating? Because here's the deal. All of us have to do that on a daily basis. Your your project ahead of you is just going to be harder than mine. And I think we just have to own that reality. Do what? Sorry. Accepting the way things are currently, um, is is very uh, hard to do. It is, it is. What's the alternative? Mm, well, to quote actually you, um, go to war with reality. Yeah, I'm kind of done going to war, Alex. Mm-hmm. All I look around to see a pile of, pile of bodies in my life, and I'm kind of done with that. Yeah. So I'm going to make peace with it. I'm going to make peace with it. But um, I, I heard you, you talk about speaking about, you know, how, how children should be brought up your whole, like, you know, they should, they should want to come home. Mm-hmm. I want my parents to think that I, I, I want to come home. I don't want them to think that I hate them. Okay. Have you, here, number one, you can't control what your parents think. And I hate that for you, but you can't. The second thing is, is no matter what's happening behaviorally, your parents have some sort of guilt over the way your brain works. So the way parents are. They're wondering what they... My my brain works. Yep. They're wondering what they ate to give you this genetic issue. Or what they... How, what part of their DNA contributed to the wiring system? You know, like parents will go to the, they will find a way to blame themselves, dude. And so it may be, you do what I just said in that last segment, but you're doing it for parents. You flip it around. How old are you? 23, sir. 23. Mm-hmm. Man. Can you imagine scrounging the money up and taking your parents out to a cheap breakfast at Cracker Barrel there in Houston? And saying, hey, I want y'all to know I love you so much. I'm so grateful for everything you've done. 
and I'm going to get to the bottom of this thing. And I'm going to ask you to, number one, um, stay with me. Don't give up on me because I'm not giving up on y'all. And I'm not giving up on Alex. Can you imagine that conversation? That would be amazing. Can you do that? Yeah. Would you do that? Here's the deal. Would you do that for you? Because you're carrying so much weight, my brother. And here's the other piece of that. Letting him know. I, I'm going to work on, just use that analogy I just gave you. I'm going to work on trying to reclaim my emotional regulation. And that means I'm going to have to get way up river. And sometimes I may put my hand up and say, I need to back off, um, step away from this conversation. Um, if you can give me a half hour, I would really appreciate it. And to tell them, don't take this as a sign of disrespect. I'm not being ugly. I just feel my body heading down a river that has a waterfall at the end of it. I don't want to do that. I'm trying to choose okay. a different way. And over time, your body hopefully will, def will, will settle in. And if it doesn't, it may never, man. You've got some neurological architecture challenges that the rest of us don't have. And so again, instead of going to war with reality, just knowing I need to avoid these kind of confrontations because I get to a place where I can't come back. And I would strongly recommend that you get with the neuropsychologist and see if there's some sort of um, some sort of exercises you can do to begin to practice emotional regulation. The brain's got a magical way of drawing from other parts of the brain that don't normally do activities to engage that part of your brain to pick up the slack. Have you already done that? Have you met with a neuropsychologist? I met with a psychologist, not a neuropsychologist, no, sir. Okay. There's some there's psychologists that are trained to look at your brain and to say, okay, here's the particular challenges in this particular part of your brain. They're gonna they're gonna they're going to express themselves behaviorally in this way. And so let's work here. Because I don't want to give you some tasks that are just unreasonable because of your brain architecture, right? Yeah, sure. I don't, I don't want you to beat yourself up for things that you can't help. I also don't want you to avoid things that you could help. You just didn't have a guy to take you through the jungle. Okay. But beyond all this stuff, before I let you go, mm -hmm. don't give up on Alex, man. Thank you. I'm serious. I can hear Thank you. you I can hear you're just freaking tired. Man. So tired. Probably tired of the seizures, tired of hurting people that you love, tired of being alone, tired of feeling alone. I, I, all my life, all I've ever thought about is myself. I took my family for granted. I hurt people that I loved. And I, I just, I don't want to be that person anymore. Okay. Two things. Number one, don't be. Number two, cut yourself some slack, dude. You've been trying to not die your whole life. Is that fair? Yes. A couple of times a day, every day for your life, you are struck by lightning. No matter where you were, in the bathroom, with friends, talking to a cute girl, wherever you happen to be, you always knew at some point I'm going to get hit. And I don't know when, and I don't know where, and I don't know how it's going to look to the person I'm talking to. And that made you short, and that made you frustrated, and that made you hard to be around sometimes. Big whoop de freaking do. See it? Yeah. If a little 12-year-old boy came up to you and was trying to apologize because somebody said, I'm going to punch you in the face twice today. You're never going to know what's coming. And you walked up and that kid snapped at you like, hey. And he said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, sir. I'm so sorry, sir. You would get down on both knees and say, little boy, someone told you they were going to hit you. It's okay. It's okay. And you'd hug that boy tightly, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Yes. Hug Alex for me, because you're not right here in front of me. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you. Don't give up. What I imagine for you in the future is you've got an extraordinary story to tell. Little kids in your exact same situation. That one day you become a really pathfinding neuroscientist or you become a great local counselor or you just become a great accountant that's got a temper and that sometimes abruptly walks away from conversations. But that people look to because you're honest and you really understand what it feels like to not be at home in your own body. And so you're able to sit with people through all sorts of hell that they've walked through. What I'm saying is the world needs you. Don't, don't rob the world of the gifts you're going to give them. Get the help you need, my man. My man. So grateful for you. We'll be right back. Hey, what's up? Now that my new book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future, is out in the wild, we've been hearing reviews and feedback from readers, and wow, I'm so grateful. And one of the things I've been most excited about hearing is that this book is not just for people who are healing from terrible traumatic experience or other big scary things from their past. This book is for everyone in every walk of life. The single 30-year-old looking to sharpen their mind, the 25-year-old hoping to make new friends, the parent who's tired of seeing their kid's eyes glued to a screen, but who doesn't know how to re-enter their life, people coming out of abusive relationships, everyone. And this book isn't me talking at you. This book is me walking with you because I've been there too. To better understand and improve your mental, relational, and emotional health, please check out Own Your Past, Change Your Future at johndeloney.com today. That's johndeloney.com today. All right, as we wrap up today's show, Kelly, I'm going to throw a quick curveball. Um, this song is one of my favorite songs in the whole world by one of my top two or three bands ever, ever. Um, the song's called The Ballad of Love and Hate by the great Avid Brothers. And I'm going to fast forward to the end of the song here. It's just a love song that they wrote between love and hate. The song ends up like this. Hate gets home, lucky to still be alive, and he screams over the sidewalk and into the drive, and the clock in the kitchen says 2.55, and the clock in the kitchen is slow. And love has been waiting, patient and kind, just wanting a phone call or some kind of sign that the one that she cares for who's out of his mind will make it back safe to her arms. And hate stumbles forward and leans in the door, weary head hung down, eyes to the floor. He says, love, I'm sorry, and she says, what for? I'm yours, and that's it whatever I should not have been gone for so long I'm yours and that's it forever you're mine and that's it forever we'll see you soon